you, thank you very much, Filippo, for the very kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. I would like, I would like to thank first the organizers, the Pedro and the Levi, Le Luis for realizing this ECF 23 under such unpredict unpredictable conditions. You know, we're engineers, we like to solve the problem with clear boundary conditions. This is uh, exceptional. Okay. This is the outline of my talk. First, I will int introduce the hydrogen problem, hydrogen embolism problem. Thanks to Claudio, you have made uh, a nice introduction for me. My job will be a little bit easier. Then I will walk you through the mechanisms, including the well established ductile fracture mechanisms. And the main hydrogen embolismed mechanisms. For the purpose to put forward a void based hydrogen embolismed mechanism. After that, I will present a void based, that's mechanism based predictive framework for hydrogen embolismed. I will talk the existing models and their predictability. I will talk a new approach, a new model we are developing. Before I finish uh, take home messages, I will talk about future perspectives. I want to warn you what I'm talking about are quite, quite new. Some of, the, uh, some of the results have just published three months ago. So in an uh, established field like hydrogen embolismment, maybe what I'm going to present is inevitably controversial. I will try my best. My, work, my talk is, uh, is part of uh, two ongoing research projects at Trondheim. The first one is multi-scale hydrogen embolismment assessment for subsea conditions that I'm leading at the NTNU. Another one is called Safe Pipelines for Hydrogen Transport, Highline. This is uh, managed by Sintef colleagues. If anyone do not know Sintef, Sintef is uh, the largest independent research institute in Scandinavia. There are many, many student experts in these two projects working on hydrogen uptake. So I assume in my talk, we know exactly how much hydrogen in the material. So I will not touch hydrogen uptake. I will talk about the modeling of hydrogen embolismment. Please allow me to borrow a picture to begin my talk. I believe many of you have, uh, have seen this, maybe have been inspired by this. Hydrogen as a carbon-free energy carrier has received worldwide attention in the last years. However, there is another side behind this promising hydrogen energy, hydrogen economy, namely the safety concerns of hydrogen infrastructure. Being the smallest atom in the world, hydrogen can diffuse into the metal, interact with the microstructure, and modify the mechanical properties, and uh, make the ductile material brittle. Hydrogen embrittlement is arguably the most complex material phenomenon. It is uh, not a new problem. It has uh, more or less 150 years history. I did a research 
in the web of science last year. I found uh, two interesting numbers. So far, we have published more than 8,000 papers in the name of hydrology embrittlement. Every year, we are publishing more than 600 papers in the last three years. Then, what is hydrology embrittlement? Hydrology embrittlement in metal is referred to as a reduction in the ductility of metal due to absorbed hydrology. It, it is not referring to the reduction in the yield stress. Maybe it could happen. It's not refer, referred to the reduction in the hardening, plastic hardening capability. It could happen, but uh, that's not the definition of hydrology embrittlement. So if, we, if you look at this figure, we have a horizontal axis represents the dis displacement or strain. Vertical axis represents the load or stress. The blue curve represents the material behavior without hydrology. So we have a flux surface. Usually it's transgranular. However, when we charge the material with hydrology, the ductility will be uh, reduced. This is a black arrow, represents the reduction of ductility. The flux surface will shift from transgranular to coarse cleavage. That's a mixture of cleavage and uh, plastic features. If you charge the hydrogen more, we will have an uh, intergranular fracture. One thing I would like to note it, despite the embrittlement, that's, a, that's a brittle. Plasticity often occurs locally and globally in hydrology embrittlement. In, in, in so you may ask, what, what's happening? What, what are the embrittlement mechanisms? So what happens here? In order, to, in order to explain what happens here, I would like to start by explaining what happens in the blue curve. This is uh, well established. We have a uh, lot of experts here. We have Professor LeBlanc, Professor Basson, Professor Kuna, all these are experts. But I would like to start with this, then I will come, come to explain what happens here. So let's start the ductile fracture mechanism. This is uh, well established. The most important feature of ductile fracture is the dimples on the fracture surface. We have a, we have a, a very good description of, uh, of the ductile, ductile fracture mechanism. Ductile fracture usually consists of three stages. We have void nucleation. That, that means we could have uh, initial voids or pre-existing voids, F0, that could come from manufacturing, that could come from the fracture or decohesion of the inclusions with the matrix, from secondary phase particles, from carbides, from grain junctions, etc. The nucleation could be uh, stress or strain control. So the process nucleated uh, voids, I call it FP. In many cases, you can use FN. Once the voids have uh, nucleated, it will glow under plastic deformation. The growth certainly is dependent on the stress state, depends on the stress tracility. However, the, the void will not glow, glow forever. Enough will be enough. So at a certain stage, void failure will occur. Void failure could occur in the, in the form of intervoid naking, could occur in the form of intervoid shearing or sheeting, depending on the stress tracility. So these are quite 
well, known underst well understood. There are many models available to describe the ductile fracture. The best known model is the Ger called the Gersing model, or GTN model, after Gersing 12 guard Niduma. GTN model is a continuum based predictive model. In my opinion, it is a constitutive equation consider considering effect of voice. There are many different versions of GTN model available. I would like to present my own version called the complete Gaussian model. Many years ago, when I was doing my PhD, I realized the Gaussian model was not complete in the sense that it cannot predict void failure. In the GTN model, coalescence is governed by an arbitrary and negotiable critical void volume fraction, FC. That I don't think is good. So I realized by incorporating a physical void failure mechanism, for example, by the modified Thomason's criteria or Benzagan Leblanc's criteria. There are many such kind of physical failure mechanisms available. By incorporating a physical void failure mechanism, we obtain a CGM, complete Gersing model. One of the important outcome of the complete Gersing model is Ductile fracture, ductile failure is 100% determined by the nucleation, void nucleation. So if you know exactly F0, if you know exactly Fp, then if you put this into the complete Gaussian model, for example, this is a GTN, I'm not going into the details. This is, a, I propose to modify Thomason criteria, including the hardening effect. So if you put the void nucleation into the complete Gersing model, then the failure is automatically predicted. If you do not know the if you do not know the nucleation of void, if you know the failure, then you, you can inversely you can inversely determine the void nucleation. So void nucleation and the failure has one to one relation. So this is, this is uh, the important aspect of a complete Gersing model. You are not done with the complete Gersing model yet, so I, I want to bother you one, one illustration. So this is, this is, uh, this is, is uh, kind of an illustration of the complete Gersing model. Think about it, you have a void. You have a void in the center of unit cell. Then you have two deformation modes, or two deformation paths. First one is a homogeneous deformation path. That means the plastic flow around the void can be homogeneous. That means the plastic deformation can go anywhere as it is necessary. This, this uh, behavior can be described by the homogeneous path, like GTN model. At the same time, there is, a, there is another deformation path. That means you can ask the plastic flow to go in a localized manner, only, only in a localized manner, not everywhere. So here we can use this, this equation to describe the path. In the beginning, when the voids are small, when the defor deformation is, uh, is uh, not much, then the force required to go localize deformation is much higher than the force, or I mean the stress, this is maximum principle of stress, is much higher than the homogeneous deformation. You know, material is not stupid. Material always choose the lowest stress 
for deformation. However, with the further increase of uh, plastic deformation, Freud grows. Then these two curves will cross each other. Then we have a point which uh, uniquely determines ductile fracture. This is called ductile void failure point. Okay. If you promise me to remember this figure, then I will go to hydrogen embrittlement. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's uh, let's ex explain the hydrogen embrittlement mechanism. As uh, Claudio mentioned, uh, there are many mechanisms available. In fact, there are more than 10 mechanisms available in hydrogen embrittlement. I will just mention three of them. First one is called hydrogen-enhanced hydrogen decohesion. That means hydrogen will weaken the atomic bond beyond the critical concentration. This is very easy to understand. Second one is called hydrogen-enhanced localized plasticity. This, when I started, started to learn uh, to look at this one, it was, uh, I was confused. I mean, how the localized plasticity could, uh, could lead to uh, embrittlement? The theory of uh, HELP tells us that hydrogen will reduce the dislocation obstacles, that means grain boundary, or interface between the matrix and the particles. We reduce the dislocation obstacles interaction energy. Or hydrogen will reduce the formation energy. If we put all these together, that means hydrogen will enhance the mobility of dislocation. In my personal understanding, maybe we can say that the help induce such, such a, a kind of local softening. So th this is uh, maybe not 100% correct. The third one I would like to introduce is a relatively recent one proposed by our Japanese colleagues. That's called HACIB. You know, plastic strain will induce vacancies. These vacancies are not necessarily stable. However, if you charge it, with hydrogen, these vacancies become stable. These vacancies will promote the formation of a void. There are a lot of disagree disagreements in the field of hydrogen embrittlement, but there is a one consensus that is no single mechanism can cover the whole pers perspective whole spectrum of hydrogen embrittlement. Hydrogen embrittlement is often a synergetic interaction of several mechanisms. You may ask, we have, uh, we have uh, so many mechanisms. Is it possible to develop mechanism-based predictive models the answer is yes or no. Yes and no. So for the if if we go through the three mechanisms, the HED mechanism, it's ready to be incorporated by the cohesive zone model. The degradation can be calculated by by the DFT, the density function theory. However, it's difficult to consider the microstructure and the plasticity in the HED mechanism. The help mechanism, help mechanism it's experimental based. It's, a, it's a very difficult to establish a critical condition. If anyone wants, if anyone wants to learn the help mechanism, there is a very nice review paper written by May Martin. I enjoyed reading that paper very much. I strongly recommend to, uh, to you to read that paper. 
the hasty mechanism, there is no explicit link to failure. However, it uh, implicitly link, link to the void. Void, that's, that's uh, very interesting. So we suddenly realize maybe we can ask a question. Can we link the voice to hydrogen embodiment? So, or can we link the hydrogen embodiment to voice? We have to do some homework to answer this question. So the homework including two parts. First, we want to look at the experimental evidence about the voice in hydrogen embodiment. Second, is we want to use our multi-scale simulation to understand how the hydrogen will influence the void nucleation, void growth, and void coalescence. So these two parts I will going, I'm going to talk. So we have a look at, look at the literature. For the stainless steel, this figure shows uncharged flux surface. We have a very nice dimples. However, if you look at, look at the flux surface with hydrogen, we still see the dimples, maybe in a different scale. So we have a look at the pipeline steel. In the case without hydrogen, we have a very well organized dimples, but uh, with hydrogen charges, we see quasi cleavage features, but there are still some dimples. For the X60 pipeline steel, even on the even on the cleavage facet, if you go down to the magnification, then we still we also see the nano dimples. So we have see seen dimples on many other different materials, including nickel-based zinc alloy, 718, and high uh, steels. I'm not going into the details here. So I would like to give you a short summary about, uh, about the experimental evidence, what we have seen. We have seen voids. in many material systems, including pipeline steels and nickel alloys. These two materials were very interested. The voids in hydrogen embrittlement, they appeared at multiple length, length scales. We have seen micro-scale dimples. We have seen nano dimples on flat cleavage facets. One thing which is interesting to mention, Professor Take in recent paper, they mentioned that the dimples in the case with hydrogen, they are shallow. They have uh, no nuclear. This is very interesting. But before we go further, I would like to make a precaution. What we have observed depends on the material system, depends on where you want to look, depends on the hydrogen concentration. So a universal conclusion is difficult to make. Okay, this is the first homework about experimental evidence. Then let's go to the second one. So we use, we use uh, molecular dynamic simulation to understand how the hydrogen can influence the void nucleation. I'm not going to the details. So what we found is that in the case, in the case with hydrogen, vacancies, hydrogen will significantly enhance the vacancy generation. So if you look at the have here the black one represents no hydrogen. The, this one represents with hydrogen. 
So we, we, we could have more than 10 times higher generation of uh, vacancies. Vacancies will promote the formation of nanovoid. So at a certain stage, nanovoid will be nucleated, either in the located in the grain boundary or inside the grain. Nanovoids will lead to immediate transgranular or intergranular failure. So this, I'm not going to talk about this. This I will leave for the future. Then we use uh, our continuum simulation capability to study if we have a, a void nucleated, then we charge it with hydrogen. What about the growth and the coalescence? So we found that void growth in a 3D cell model with the, with the help with the local softening at the input, the void growth will be promoted, will be enhanced by the hydrogen. So we also found that the growth with the hydrogen can be expressed as the growth without the hydrogen multiplied by a linear combination, a linear function of the hydrogen concentration. So this is uh, what we need in the next formulation. What about the coalescence? So we found that hydrogen in the form of uh, help can introduce uh, intervoid shearing, shearing failure. Normally we have in intervoid naking without the hydrogen. So with hydrogen we will have intervoid shearing. This will significantly reduce the ductility. So based on this, I would like to put forward a rushing now for a void-based hydrogen embrittlement mechanism. First point is hydrogen will enhance the void nucleation growth via help and adhesive. So maybe this is uh, disputable. So I assume that the initial void. If you have initial void in the blue curve, you will have initial void in the orange and red curve. So initial void or pre-existing void will not be strongly influenced by the hydrogen. However, the process nucleated void will be greatly influenced by, by the hydrogen. Growth of void will be enhanced by, by the hydrogen. All this can be expressed by, by a kind of a linear function of hydrogen concentration. Num point number two, hydrogen embrittlement may fail in the following three, three modes. First, we can still have a void failure, but hydrogen will enhance the void failure. So this is important. Second one, which is difficult to understand, we, we have hydrogen enhanced decohesion, this is HEDE, but with the voids. However, the void does not have any influence on the HEDE, so HEDE is dominating. Then we have a third one, hydrogen enhanced intervoid decohesion. See, this decohesion will be influenced by voids. So these are three outcomes of, uh, of the, um, Hydrogen embrittlement. Okay, so based on the rushing now, I propose the mechanisms for hydrogen embrittlement as follows. We start with we start with the the, the ductile fracture, void failure, where void nucleation grows and coalescence, and uh, with hydrogen, there is a possibility that. Maybe the in initial void may be slightly influenced by, by the hydrogen. However, the growth and nucleation of uh, FP will be greatly influenced by, by hydrogen. So we have a hydrogen enhanced void failure. Third one, we have, a, we have a hydrogen, hydrogen influenced 
avoid the growth, but the outcome is actually the, the fourth one, which is uh, very interesting. So we have a uh, we have uh, same as uh, number two, but we have a uh, hydrologic enhanced intervoid decohesion. So these are the four mechanisms I put together. Now, I will bring you back to the, to the CGM because all these mechanisms involve, involve the void. So we have a, a well-established framework for, for the ductile fracture. So my intention is to bring all these under the roof of a CGM. So we have a CGM, use a U UMAT and VUMAT, explicit and implicit. So here, of course, we need, uh, we need hydrology. So we need hydrogen diffusion model to, uh, to pump the hydrogen into, uh, into the uh, framework. So we have, uh, in, the, in the implicit, we have used Emilius code and uh, Andreas, Andreas Diaz, he has helped us to develop uh, explicit code. So we put it together, we call this HCGM predictive framework. So I'm sorry I have to bring you again to, to this. I hope you have remembered that pass A and pass B. So in fact, there is a, a pass C, which we never realized before. So we have a decohesion. So we can force the material to break the bone. Anyone who has studied the fracture mechanics knows the stress needed to break the bone is about one tenth of the elastic modulus. So this pass C will never, never ever occur in the case without the hydrogen, right? So how things will happen if you, if you charge the material with hydrology. So pass A will be modified slightly. Pass B will be modified significantly. And pass C will modified even more. So these are the three passes. We can pack that into, into the complete Gaussian model. Here is the existing model. So about five years ago, my student, Haiyang Yu, he used the help, he used the help to study the, the hydrogen effect on the, if we have existing void, if you charge it with hydrogen, how the void, the growth and the coalescence will be influenced. So he developed a, a preliminary HCG CGM model, but this one was not predictive. Last year, Ghent University, the Pratis, Robin the Pratis, he used my CGM and modified it with, uh, with his own diffusion code. He was the first one to present the first predictive predictive model and including two parameters, Kn and Kg. So this year, Maitre he presented the, the latest, latest version, including the HEDE. So here is uh, the illustration of the latest HCGM predictive model. If we have uh, no hydrogen, we will have pass B. If we have hydrogen, it will be, it will be B1. So the reduction of ductility will, will be predict, predicted. So if you have, uh, at the same time, if we, if we start with the, the pass C, the hydrogen will dramatically reduce the, the Sigma one for pass C, it goes to, 
to here. So we predict the reduction of uh, ductility will be here. So I, w I will be finished soon. So here are some examples of the predict predict predictability. I'm not going into the details. So this is a prediction of ductility reduction by head. This is uh, by head. And we can, we can combine this together. We can make these two mechanisms in competition. So this is the help, this is the HEDE, and this is uh, the competition. We have a help dominated. We have a HEDE dominated. I don't think I have time for this. And uh, I would like to show you the possibility of uh, predicting the transgranular and the intergranular fracture path. So we can easily, we can easily consider the inhomogeneity and the microstructure features into the HCGM model. So this is the transgranular, this is the intergranular. There is one limitation of the current CGM model. That means it cannot consider the interaction between the plasticity and the degradation. What we are working now is try to develop a help or adhesive controlled interval degradation. That means we can, we can have a atomistic simulation inspired hydrogen vacancy strain relationship. And we can consider this process. I'm not going to talk more. I think this could be easily become an ERC proposal. So perspective. So with the HCGM, we can predict the evolution of the susceptibility of, uh, of the material. So we can determine, we can determine the HCGM parameters for the transferability. Okay, so this is uh, my last slide. We have uh, proposed a void-based continuum level mechanism. It incorporates all the major lower level hydrogen embolismant mechanism. It combines, combines the plasticity and the cohesion. It integrates the ductile fracture and the uh, HE. This is uh, very special. And we can enable the transferability from lab to the component. Thank you.